first reading is from the letter to the Ephesians, from the fourth chapter. In, in the beginning of this fourth chapter, the, the writer pleads for unity in the body of Christ. These are verses one through six. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. May God add blessing to the reading and the understanding of this scripture. You're invited to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. We continue in John's gospel. And after the feeding of the 5,000, the next day, the crowds were seeking Jesus out and, and trying to find him. And when they found him, it, it seemed as if the crowd wanted to believe and follow him, yet they wanted a sign. This is John 6, verses 28 through 35. Then they said to Jesus, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe in you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Do we really want to, you know, reconnect with one another? That's the title of the sermon. What next? Reconnecting with each other. And, you know, we, when we were isolated at home, when we were given the mandate to, to shelter at home, the complaining and the whining we did that we couldn't be out and about and we couldn't see each other and, and it was so horrible. And now that the restrictions have ended, do we really want to reconnect with each other? You know, it's harder to it's harder to reconnect with each other because, because as we think about it, we, we have to negotiate those complex conversations. We have to decide again what we can talk about and what is off limits, you know, whether it's politics or pandemics or, re, or religion. It's easier just to stay at home, to stay with the people that we know and who probably think like us and, and look sort of like us. Plus, we can wear what we want. I mean, we can wear our sweats or we can wear a favorite comfortable t-shirt even if it's worn or torn or maybe has a few, uh, I don't know, ice cream stains or popsicle stains on it. Maybe it's easier just to be alone. I, I think that's a, a little bit of what Jesus experiences today. It says after he feeds the 5,000, remember he has, he has asked the disciples to go away by themselves for a while and, and the crowds follow him and so he, he feeds them in this miraculous feeding with five loaves and two fish that a little boy comes forward and has as, as he blesses them and distributes all the food and they all eat and they're satisfied and, and there are 12 baskets full of, of fragments left over. It says that Jesus senses that they intend to make him king. See, they remember King David. Their ancestors have, have, have told them, that their grandparents and great-grandparents and those going before have told, have told them about how wonderful life was when David was king and, and they were on top militarily and, and politically and, and David had a way of bringing everybody together and, and Jesus senses that they want to make him king because, you know, we human beings, we, we want... We, we want to capture a, a something that is good. Uh, we want to put it in a box. We want to, we want to lock it up so we can define it and, and see it and bring it out anytime we want and maybe put it away anytime we want. It's sort of what they want to do with Jesus. They want to make him a, a political leader, 
as well as the religious leader. And so it says Jesus goes away by himself up the mountain. Because sometimes it's just easier to isolate than to try to negotiate why you don't want to be a king. And while Jesus goes up the mountain, the Gospel of John says that the disciples go down to a boat in the evening uh, on the water and they decide to go across the sea again. And, and they're about three or four miles out is what John's Gospel says and a, a big windstorm blows up. Again, the Gospels have, uh, most of them have a, a version of this story. It's in the middle of the night. There's a horrible storm raging. And Jesus comes toward them walking on water. And, and the disciples become terrified. And Jesus tells them not to be afraid that it's him. Now, in other Gospels, uh, Peter gets at, you know, stands up and says, If it's you, let me come to you walking on the water. And there's that whole stuff with Peter getting out and then sinking. And then Jesus bringing him back to the boat. In, in another gospel, Jesus is asleep in the boat already and, and he wakes up and he calms the storm. In, in John's gospel, it doesn't show Peter walking on water. It doesn't even say Jesus calms the storm. It says that the disciples want him to get into the boat. We don't know if he does or not. It says suddenly they are at the other shoreline. So we don't even know if he calmed the storm. But they get out of the boat and again, there are crowds of people. And they come and they say, to Jesus, how, how did you get here? There aren't two boats, and we saw the disciples leave the shoreline without you. And Jesus says, you've found me again because you ate your fill. What you should be asking for is food that doesn't perish. Food, bread that will endure even to eternal life. That's the kind of food you should be working for. And the people say, well, what does it mean to do the works of God? That's where our, our reading started this morning. What does it mean to do the works of God? And Jesus says the work of God is to believe the one that God has sent. He is the bread of life. And they say, that sounds great. We want that. But if you really are what you say you are, if you are the one God has sent in whom we are to believe, well, we, as Sean said, we, we need a sign. Okay, he's, he's fed 5,000 people and they were part of that crowd with five loaves and two fish. They have surmised that he has evidently found a way across the water without being in a boat. He says to them, the, the bread that doesn't perish is believing, uh, the work of that bread is believing in the one whom God has sent. And they say, oh, but wait, we want a sign. We want more. It's not enough. Isn't that so human? <laughs> okay, we saw that miracle where you fed the 5,000. Okay, maybe you walked on water, but we really need to know this time. We, we really need to know. You see, what happened in the wilderness is that Moses brought down manna from heaven for our families to eat. So what are you going to do for us now? Right? We're kind, of a, we're kind of a community of never enough, we human beings. We're, we're kind of a, a people of, I have faith, but... But what you've done isn't quite enough. Could I have more and more and more and more? And Jesus says, you're missing the point. It wasn't Moses who brought manna down from heaven. It's God who sends the bread of life from heaven so that all might eat and have eternity. Is it enough for us? You know that promise. And then Jesus says the verse that I started my sermon with last week. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never hunger. The one who believes in me will never thirst. And again, we have to decide, is that enough? I mean, we, we like believing in Jesus. Jesus says, this is the work of God to believe in the one whom he has sent. And we like to believe in Jesus, but you know, a little concrete manna would be okay with us. 
maybe every day, a, 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 little, a little miracle to remind us that we're affirmed as God's beloved children. Uh, uh, just a, a little bit more of, uh, of, of the kind of extraordinary that we expect God to do. You know, Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus the magician, Jesus the healer of every illness. See, we don't have a problem believing in Jesus. It's just the whole doing what Jesus would want us to do if we believe in him. Uh, following this living word. You know, that whole blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, they receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's all, that's all like maybe a little too much for us. We, we would rather just have the magical part. The bread that won't perish without the work part of believing in all of what he says and does. We aren't the only ones. You heard what Paul says to the people in the church at Ephesus this morning. I beg you, he says, as a, as a prisoner of the Lord, I beg you to live lives worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In humility, in patience, in gentleness, bearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain a unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, one calling in the hope to which you have been called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, in all, and through all. Can one person use the word one any more times in one sentence? I mean, there are several verses in there, but, but really that last verse has the word one in it more times than almost any other word that is used. Do you get Paul's emphasis? Do we want to come out of sheltering at home? Do we want to come out of isolation? Do we want to reconnect with one another? Or is it just easier not to? Because <laughs> we don't have to decide whether we want to share bread with people with whom we have major disagreements about politics or pandemics or religion. It's easier to wear what we want, do what we want, eat what we want, and not think about what it means to authentically build relationship across divisions. Paul is talking to those who are Jewish and those who are Gentile, where there has been a wall, or there's been a dividing line, there's been a disunity, and he's asking them to have a unity of spirit in the bond of peace. He's asking them to live the life of Jesus as they believe in him. He's asking them to overcome the desire to maintain silos of difference. If you hate the people that I hate, that we'll be together. Is that really the way we want to connect? <laughs> it's not about us helping one another when we're in need. It's not about being there for one another to stand in the gap when our faith is weak. It's about let's agree together who the enemy is and then that will connect us. And we know that doesn't work. <laughs> Paul knows it doesn't work. Jesus knows it doesn't work. You, you, know, what I've been, you know what I've been meditating on over the, over the last month? The 23rd Psalm. Who doesn't love the 23rd Psalm? I love the 23rd, 23rd Psalm because I, I want the peace that it offers. I want, I want the promise that, is, that it offers. You can hear it with me again or maybe you want to say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. 
He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Wait, what? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But wait. <laughs> you know the verse that has caught me. The first part of verse, f first, first part of verse 5 of the 23rd Psalm. Right smack dab in the middle of that psalm. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. No, no, wait a minute. What, what, what about the green pastures? What about the still waters? What, what about the restoration of my soul? What, what about the promise that I don't have anything to fear? I've used that, friends, over and over again. You have nothing to fear as you approach death because God is with you. Whatever that rod and staff are that God needs to use to give us comfort in the midst of that valley of shadow of death, God will, God will use. And, and the anointing, my head with oil, that's the anointing of healing. And, sh and goodness and mercy shall follow me and my cup will overflow. But wait, in the middle of all of that, there's what? You prepare us a table before me. Oh yeah, that bread that we want, that bread of life that endures to eternity. Thou prepare us a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God just won't let up. The living word that is Jesus just won't let up. The apostle Paul just won't let up. I beg you, Paul says, to be worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In humility and gentleness and patience, Bearing one another in love. Making every effort to maintain unity. In the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. And one calling and hope to which you have been called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. Who is above all and in all and through all. Welcome to the banquet table. Welcome to communion. Welcome to the place where we lay down our differences and we share together one loaf, the body of Christ, the bread of life, one cup one spirit, one faith, one love from one eternal God, above all, in all, and through all, a unity of spirit in the bond of peace. So may it be. Amen.